Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Ramos, the Deputy Director of the Division of Genomic Medicine at the National Human Genome Research Institute. We wanted to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, we are uh, excited to provide you some information regarding the Multi-Omics for Health and Disease program. In a moment, I'll introduce my colleagues, um, but first I wanted to walk through the agenda with you. So I'll just quickly review the participation guidelines, and then I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Joanella Morales, who's a program director in the Division of Genomic Medicine at NHGRI to provide more specifics on each of the three components of this program. Uh, within that presentation, we'll also hear from our colleagues, Drs. Kim McAllister and Leah Mechanic from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Cancer Institute, given they're both co-sponsoring this program. We will um, ask Joanella to provide a few answers to some of the most common FAQs we've already received, and then we'll open it up for additional dialogue uh, Q&A through the Q&A feature of our, our Zoom webinar. Next slide, please. So just a reminder, this was on the screen when you joined. We do have a large number of participants with us. Your video and audio are turned off by default. In fact, because of the number of participants, we are going to use the Q&A function primarily. So we'll do our best to collect all your questions, respond to them live. If it's possible, I'm sorry, if, if we need to provide any follow-up information, we'll make sure to do that. We'll update the FAQ. Those will be posted on the NHGRI website. The webinar itself will actually be recorded as well. And then if you have any specific follow-up questions, you can always reach out to us. Uh, the email address for the multi-omics team is listed on this PowerPoint slide. And we would ask if you have nuanced questions about your particular study, perhaps those might be best addressed via an email, but we're looking forward to responding to as many general questions as possible today. Next. So again, this is our NIH Multiomics program team. My colleagues at NHGRI have joined us today, Jyoti Dayal, Iman Martin, as I mentioned, Joanella Morales, myself, Aaron Ramos, and Riley Wilson. From NCI, we have Leah Mechanic and Melissa Rotuno, and NIEHS, Kim McAllister. And before we get any further, I really wanted to thank our colleagues with the AV and Communications team for setting up the webinar and the website and for doing the, the post-production processing as well. So a big thank you to Gerald Samani, Makul Andarukar, Alvaro Encinas, and William May. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Morales for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Erin, for giving me the opportunity to provide a little bit more detail about the multi-omics program and the funding opportunity announcements that we published earlier this month. As Erin noted, I will start by providing some relevant background and rationale for this program, and then focus on some of the key aspects of the consortium. So a little bit of background, as most of you are no doubt aware, recent advances in high throughput technologies over the years have led to increase, increased access to distinct molecular data types or omics data, and some of which are noted here, genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. And the funding opportunity announcements we are discussing today are focused on multiomics, which we are defining here as a systems biology approach, where the focus is on the biological system as a whole, where the multiple omic data types are of interest, and the expectation is that the integration of all these data types will lead, will provide insights that go beyond what each single omic type alone can produce. Now, the systems biology approach also implies the comprehensive assessment of the biological system, whether that's an individual, a tissue, or a cell, including the environmental exposures to which it is subject. Now, this, of course, requires a use of high throughput technologies, and, and that generates a huge amount of data, or so-called big data. So multiomics integration has been shown to be particularly useful in a number of areas, including the ones that I've listed here. For example, to improve the way disease subtypes are defined, 
or to identify more precise biomarkers than the ones identified by single omics approaches, or to define relationships between data types. And while successes have been recorded in the literature, opportunities do remain to maximize the, maximize the benefits of multi-omics approaches. For example, computational methods to integrate multiple omic data types with other data types, for example, clinical and environmental exposure data are still underdeveloped. So the RFAs that we are discussing today aim to provide opportunities to move the field forward in this scientific area. Now, the overarching goal of this program is to validate and enhance generalizable multiomic approaches to identify meaningful biological changes related to health and disease. And this will be done by establishing a consortium that will bring together experts to apply multiomics approaches in several disease contexts. And now these experts will first explore the use of multiomics to detect and assess molecular profiles that are associated with healthy and disease states. They will then leverage these exploratory studies to develop generalizable data harmonization, integration, and analysis methods, best practices, and standards. And finally, using all the data that is generated in the program, the consortium will create a multi-dimensional data set along with a visualization portal that will be available to the wider research community and will be interoperable with existing resources. As we note in the R phase, the Multiomics for Health and Disease Consortium is composed of three components. First are the disease study sites, which uh, we have outlined in RFA HG22008, and we intend to fund up to six disease study sites. The second component is the Omics Production Center or centers, which we have outlined in RFA HG22009, and we intend to fund no more than two OPCs. And finally, the Data Analysis and Coordination Center or DAC, and we outline um, the, the DAC in RFA HG22010, and we intend to fund one DAC. Now, the three components will form a steering committee for governance and working groups to carry out the work of the consortium. I will now go in and describe key aspects of each component in a bit more detail. And just as a reminder, I'm providing an overview here, but you can find obviously more details in the RFAs, and as Aaron noted at the end of this presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Okay, so let's talk about the disease study sites or DSSs. And as I just noted, we intend to fund up to six DSSs, and we expect that each DSS would propose a study focused on a disease area where there is evidence that an integrative multiomics approach would be particularly impactful. For example, that it would help to define molecular profiles associated with healthy and disease states, and that would detect changes to these profiles over time. The proposed study should also be able to detect aspects of disease progression within the five-year time frame of this program. So, for example, to detect change from one state to the other or transitions across state states. And some examples we highlighted in the RFA include diseases with clear distinct stages, for example, relapsing diseases with exacerbations and remissions, or diseases with distinct stages or transitions, and diseases where a strong environmental component can be measured within the time frame of the program. Each DSS should demonstrate the ability to enroll a minimum of 300 participants so 200 participants with disease and 100 generally healthy participants. Each DSS should also ensure that at least 75% of the enrolled participants are from self-identified racial and or ethnic communities that are expected to have genetic ancestries currently understudied in genomics research. We expect the DSSs to follow appropriate recruitment, retention, and community engagement strategies and processes, and to obtain broad data sharing consent for the collection of multiple measures from multiple omics uh, data types taken at multiple time points. Now, each DSS will be responsible for collecting phenotypic and environmental exposure data, including social determinants of health, and using standard measures when those are available. 
Each DSS will also be responsible for collecting bio uh, specimens at a minimum of three time points, for example, at baseline levels um, or, or at any of the disease states. Samples can be obtained using non-invasive methods, for example, from blood, urine, or saliva, though if suitable for the disease that is being proposed, tissue or biopsy samples may be appropriate. Now, the disease study sites should budget for the management of the biosamples, including the cost for submitting the samples to the omics production centers, which I will describe in a couple of minutes. Now, while the omics production centers will take place at the, sorry, while the omic, the production of omics data will be, will take place at the omics production centers, each DSS is expected to propose omics technologies and assays to be applied considering the unique characteristics of the disease that is being proposed. Now, in terms of analysis and methods development, each DSS should propose technological and computational analytical protocols that are appropriate, again, for the disease that is being proposed and the omics technologies that also are being proposed as part of the study design. Each DSS should also propose methodological approaches to address some of the challenges that we aim to address with this, this consortium related to the application of multi-omics technologies. And finally, each DSS will need to demonstrate that the approaches and methods that are proposed to be utilized or will be developed should be generalizable across ancestrally diverse populations. Okay, so now let's move on to the second component the, of the consortium. These are the omics production centers. And as the name implies, the role of the OPCs is to utilize state-of-the-art, high-throughput technologies to produce omics data from the samples, including the tissues and cells as needed, that are collected by the six DSSs that I described previously. The samples, the FOAs, or so this FOA is targeting the five omics data types that are listed here, genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. And the second and third columns outline the expected data and the typical assays for each omic data type, respectively. Now, while the data types and assays listed here are, are definitely um, relevant for, for this FOA, there is some flexibility for the OPCs to be innovative and suggest other ohms or assays provided that the data production can be made within the allocated budget for the OPCs. Now also noted in the RFA is our preference to, to fund one omics production center that would receive the samples from all six DSSs and produce the five omics data types that, are, that were, I listed in the previous slide. Noting of course that there will be recurrent cycles of omic production since the DSSs will be collecting biosamples at more than one time point. Now we do recognize that it may be challenging to assemble a team with a capability and expertise to produce all data types. And so for this reason, we are allowing applicants to propose fewer than five omics data types with some caveats, a minimum of three omic data types must be proposed. Of those, one must be genomics and one must be non-nucleic acid, for example, non-nucleic acid based, for example, proteomics or metabolomics. In such scenarios, we would consider then funding two OPCs and hopefully achieve the goal of, of producing all the data types that we're hoping for this RFA. And each, each OPC, of course, would be responsible for proposing a plan for how it will receive the samples and how uh, they will perform the assays. Now, similar to the DSSs, each OPC should propose technological and computational protocols appropriate for the omics technologies that are being proposed in the application. And again, each OPC should also propose methodological approaches to address some of the challenges that I've mentioned previously related to the application of multi-omics to study health and disease. And again, each OPC will need to demonstrate that these approaches are generalizable across ancestrally diverse populations. And so moving on to the third and final component, 
the Data Analysis and Coordination Center. And as the name suggests, this center will coordinate consortium activities and logistics, including a year-long consortium-wide protocol development process, collaborative data analysis efforts, the joint development and optimization of methods, the use of Anvil workspaces, and it will perform outreach for the consortium and finally produce a user-friendly website to highlight the products of the consortium. The DAC will be also responsible for, for facilitating the submission of consortium data to the Anvil platform. That means that it will facilitate defining the submission process, also defining the data standards and data model that will be utilized, and finally validating that all consortium data is, is, is following those data standards and models prior to submission. The DAC is also responsible for creating the multidimensional data set that will be released by the consortium. And here I have highlighted the characteristics of the data set. And so the DAC is responsible for ensuring that the data set includes all of the components listed here. The DAC will also liaise with the ANVIL um, and the DAC will also make sure that novel and previously known variant interpretations are submitted to ClimVar and creating that open access online data resource uh, to share summary level data from the program. Okay, so hopefully that has given you a, a good overview of each component. And so now I will briefly talk about consortium wide activities. In order for the goals of this program to be achieved, we require a high degree of coordination and collaboration. And so for this reason, the consortium will devote its first year to developing network-wide protocols, some of um, listed here for the key aspects of the work. And I've, I've listed some here, community engagement approaches, recruitment strategies, the plan for the collection of, of measures, of phenotypic and environmental exposure measures, how to process and procure the samples, what omics assays will be will be performed, the methodology, the data models, and finally the plan for utilizing the Anvil platform. And as I've mentioned before, the DAC is responsible for facilitating this process. The analysis of the data and the development of methods is also a cross consortium activity. So the consortium will aim to carry out the analyses that I have listed here. So integrating data, defining profiles, detecting changes identifying networks and so forth. And I, I mentioned earlier, but working groups will be established to facilitate all the collaborative work that we envision as part of this consortium. In terms of the timeline, I've mentioned that the first year will be focused on developing, developing the network-wide protocols. Year two of the program will be devoted to the enrollment of participants, the collection of measures, of baseline measures, and the collection of biosamples that will be then submitted to the OPCs. During years three and four, the consortium will collect subsequent measures, the subsequent biosamples. It will focus strongly on the analysis of data and the development of methods and start the process of standardizing and harmonizing the data that has already been produced. And then finally, in year five, the consortium will work towards finalizing all the analyses starting to create that data set that will be released towards the end of the program and developing that portal and disseminating outputs and findings. In terms of governance, a steering committee will be the main body that will govern the consortium. It will guide the overall direction, scientific direction, and it will be composed of the PIs from the, all the sites and centers as well as NIH program staff. As noted earlier, working groups will be created to facilitate collaborative work. And finally, an external scientific panel will be created to provide input on performance, priorities, and overall progress. Now, one important area for this consortium is diversity. And as you're aware, there is an overrepresentation of European ancestry individuals in genomics research. And of course, there are scientific, social, and ethical challenges that are associated with this. Also, importantly, there is a lack of diversity in terms of the genomics workforce. So they, this set of RFAs, this program, aims to address both of these concerns. So to increase the diversity of genetic ancestries, 
This program expects that 75% of individuals enrolled by each DSS should be from racial and or ethnic communities expected to have genetic ancestries that are understudied in genomics. And to uh, enhance the excellence and in inclusivity of the research environment, we expect all sites and centers to assemble study teams that are diverse and to provide full opportunity and participation to individuals and groups that are, are, are underrepresented in genomics workforce, in the genomics workforce. Now, let me say a few words about the ANVIL ecosystem. We expect the data analysis and the methods development to be performed using cloud-based approaches within the ANVIL. Now, ANVIL stands for Analysis, Visualization, and Informatics Lab, lab Space. It is an NHGRI designated data repository that provides a cloud-based infrastructure and a secure environment for data storage and for analysis. So using the Anvil, the Anvil platform will allow the analysis by each site and center, as well as allowing for that collaborative analysis and the development of methods that we are expecting as part of this program. And again, because the, D the DAC will be responsible for managing the collaborative efforts, the ANVIL allows for the DAC to be able to manage all the data. Now, here's a hypothetical diagram of how the consortium could interact with the ANVIL ecosystem. It, uh, for example, each site and center could have a private workspace for data analysis and methods development, but shown here in purple, there would also be a shared workspace that would be set up for creating that data set that will be released and for any joint efforts that um, need to be performed as part of the program. Let me say briefly that this program is expected to be in compliance with NIH's genomic data sharing policy. So we expect all applicants to provide a data sharing plan in the resource sharing plan. We expect that applicants will plan for data to be submitted in the appropriate repositories. So ANVIL for all controlled access data and ClinVar for variant interpretations. We expect that um, applicants would ensure appropriate consent, that appropriate consent is obtained. So general research use for future re research use and broad data sharing and also to share comprehensive metadata and phenotypic clinical and environmental exposure data. So if you want to know a little bit more about this, you can go to the RFAs or you can go to the websites that are listed at the bottom of this slide. And now I would like to invite my colleague, Kim McAllister from the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences to talk a little bit more about the interest, interest of her institute. Okay. Kim. Thanks. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Kim Kalstar, and I'm from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And I think um, many of you probably already know that this institute is interested in studying uh, uh, many different toxicants and chemicals that have an impact on disease. And we do recognize that a lot of environmental exposures not just affect onset of disease, but severity and progression of different disease outcomes as well. Um, so we were really excited to be joining this new consortium effort because we've really recognized for a long time that there's a real gap in methods and approaches and guidance for how to integrate a lot of different diverse environmental data with other omics data. And so we're hoping that some exciting innovative methods and approaches related to harmonizing and integrating complex environmental health data with other omics will uh, really come out of this consortium. And um, you also may know that NIHS has a long, strong history of community engagement, especially in relation to exploring environmental health disparities and environmental justice issues. And so the strong focus on underrepresented groups in this consortium, um, therefore really fit with our interest as well. Um, so please just reach out to me if you have questions related to putting in an application uh, for these RFAs that has an environmental exposure component to it. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. And now I would like to invite my colleague, Leah Mechanic from the NCI to talk a little bit more about in NCI's interests. Great. Thank you, Janela. 
Um, so hi, I'm Leah Mechanic. I'm from the National Cancer Institute. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Melissa Rotuno, and we are program directors in the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. The NCI supports cancer research to advance scientific knowledge to prevent, detect, diagnose, and treat cancer, and to help cancer survivors live longer, healthier lives. For this RFA, NCI is interested in supporting a disease study site that is focused on cancer. And note that studies collecting both tumor and normal tissues from cancer cases are strongly encouraged and will be prioritized for funding. We're excited about this RFA and we see several unique opportunities uh, here, including informing how we can scale these multi-omic studies to larger population-based studies, supporting the collection of longitudinal samples, integrating environmental data with multi-omics data, and the emphasis on the study of social determinants of health and ancestral diverse populations. And with that, we're happy as well at NCI. Uh, you can email Melissa and I if you have any questions uh, and I'll turn it over or turn it back to Janella. Thanks, Liam. And I only have a couple more slides left before we go into the Q&A session. First, I'd like to remind you of the review criteria that will be used to review your applications. You can see here in orange the five general categories that are um, that will be used for review. And I, I would encourage you to go to the RFAs and review the criteria because uh, each RFA has um, slightly different review criteria. And also to note the key dates to, as a reminder, the letters of intent are due October 18. The applications are due November 19. And that means that the awards will likely be issued sometime in the summer of 2023. Again, Erin already mentioned this, but you can find our email address here below and you can send any additional questions that may come up after this webinar um, is over. Finally, just to point out that this program does have a page on NHGRI's website. That's where the recording will be posted. And we also will post a compilation of all the Q and A's that will come up during this discussion for future reference. So thank you all for listening and, and thank you all for, the, there are a few of you who contacted us ahead of time with questions. And so we thought that one thing we would do is to go through some of those top questions that were asked and then Aaron will uh, lead us through a an open time of Q and A's. So I'm just gonna go through some of these key questions. Hopefully that will provide some answers that you can then follow up in the Q and A. Okay, so the first question was, well, what, what diseases are eligible? And you've heard from my colleagues about their IC-specific interests. The NHGRI as an institute is disease agnostic. So we did not include a list of specific diseases for um, applicants to focus on. Rather, our focus is on the kinds of diseases that would accomplish the goals of our program. So the, the DSS is need to focus on a disease area where they can use multiomics approaches to define associations and to detect changes to association profiles over time. So they need to describe how the proposed study will do this. Also, applicants need to demonstrate that they their study will allow for the detection of aspects of disease progression during the five-year timeframe of the program. The DSSs also need to be able to perform a meaningful study with the 300 participants that I outlined early on. So 200 with disease and 100 without disease. And again, disease areas that have a strong environmental component will be especially relevant for this program. So while we don't provide a list of specific diseases, I've generally outlined the kinds of diseases that we're interested in. And in the RFAs, we do highlight as examples diseases such as relapsing diseases with exacerbations and remissions or diseases that have a very distinct, distinct stages or transitions. So hopefully that's helpful as you think about the diseases that are eligible for these RFAs. Second question briefly, can all participants enrolled by a DSS be from one understudy population? So I, I already mentioned the emphasis and focus on diversity, and that's why we have focused on 75%. Um, We're expecting that at least 75% of the participants come from communities, racial and or ethnic communities that are expected to
to have genetic ancestries that are currently under study. Now, applicants who want to focus 100% on one particular population should demonstrate that, first of all, they can meet the requirements of the RFA and that it would be advantageous for the success of the study to have participants that have a fairly homoge homogeneous background. Okay, question number three, can existing cohorts be used? Well, first, given that an important goal of this initiative is the development of methods and standards and the creation of a harmonized and standardized data set, we do prefer new participant enrollment. We do note in the RFA, you might have seen that existing cohorts will be considered if the applicant can demonstrate how they meet the requirement for the program, particularly the need to conform to protocols that will be developed during that first year of the consortium, and also the fact that we have a five-year program. Applicants would need to make a compelling case that their existing cohort would be suitable for the program. Question number four, how many OMS are expected? So I did mention in one of my slides that the goal for the OPCs is to produce the five molecular categories that I've listed. So genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. But we do, do say that other omics data types will be considered with appropriate justification. And so here you demonstrate that the additional omics data types are relevant for the disease that is being studied and the fit within the allocated budget. Now, a DSS can also propose additional omic data types, again, provided that the DSS is still able to meet the expectations of the RFA and that the addition of omic data types is scientifically justifiable and meet data sharing standards. But I, I here I want to emphasize that ultimately, decisions will be made during that planning year. And, and it needs to it needs to account the capabilities of the of the OPCs at the time at that during that first year. So we also note that applications proposing less than five data types will be considered, provided that at least three of the proposed data types, that, that at least three data types are proposed, that one of those is genomics, and that one is nucleic acid-based, in other words, proteomics or metabolomics. Question number five, and we only have a few more frequently asked questions, and then um, I'll let Aaron lead us. Question number five, how well, how well established should the environment disease connection be? And here we do say very clearly that our program aims to integrate environmental exposure data so disease areas that have a strong environmental component will be especially relevant. Now, if the DSS is planning to incorporate environmental exposure measures, there should be appropriate justification in terms of the preliminary data or extensive background literature to establish that connection between the environmental exposure and onset progression or severity of, of disease. And finally, I believe, um, what should the year one budget be given the program timeline, especially referring to the fact that that first year will be a planning year? And so here I would say that applicants should propose a budget limit that is the same for all years of the program. And so as a reminder for the DSSs, each DSS has um, 500,000 direct cost cap, the OPCs 2.7 million direct costs if producing all the all omics data types. And for the DAC, that's 950,000 direct costs. So hopefully it's been helpful to go through these six frequently asked questions. And now I will um, let Aaron help us through the Q&A that you have proposed. Joanella, that was terrific. Thanks so much for the comprehensive overview. We do, we have 16 questions in the chat. We're gonna to try to answer as many of them as we can live. We did answer two questions already in um, uh, via the, the text feature. So we'll start with our first question um, and I'll ask Joti to respond. What will the role of the OPCs for data analysis B, and are they supposed to be blinded for data processing? 
Thank you, Aaron. Um, just as a quick sound check, can everyone hear me? You sound clear. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so uh, applicants should describe their experience, um, and this is written in the RFA, the Computational and Statistical Data Integration and Data Analysis Methods um, in a cloud-based uh, tool development um, and uh, data wrangling, and then work within the Anvil ecosystem or similar cloud-based platform. And this is something that we would, um, we would decide uh, the methods decision in uh, year one for the, the protocol development. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. So, so just to uh, be clear on that, the, the OPCs as, as well, um, they could sort of include in their justification their, their preference and thoughts on, on being uh, blinded. But again, as Jyoti said, the decision will be made in the first plan, first year planning period by the consortium as a whole. Thank you. Okay, next question. Is it anticipated that the program will pull components from proposals for a final consortium or will they fund proposals in total? So I'll turn this over to Joanella to respond. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Oh, yeah, you can hear me. Thanks, Aaron, for that. So, um, Sorry, could you repeat the question, Aaron? I yeah, no problem. It's the, here with... in the Q and A. It's the question at the top. Is it anticipated that program will pull components from proposals for final consortium, or will they fund proposals in total? So the plan is to fund proposals in total. We will not be pulling, taking parts of of the different applications. Thank you, Joanella. I will just add one point there that for, if you look at the OPCs FOA, we do write it as funding one to two OPCs, meaning that if there is an OPC, and I, Joan, I'll cover this. Uh, if there's an OPC that is comprehensive, covers all of the ohms, that could be sufficient, but it, it's possible that we may uh, bring in two components of um, two separate OPCs. Thanks, Aaron, for clarifying that. Okay, next question. What is the amount of direct funding that would be available in year one for an OPC? Uh, Joanella did answer that in your FAQs. If you have that, Joanella, I just want yeah. to pull it up and restate that. I, I Let me find the, the slide, but I did say that for direct costs, it would be 2.7 million. I think you're asking for, and this is for the OPCs, oh, and it's right. the same, and it's the same um, year one to year five, we're expecting the same budget. Thank you. And thank you, Riley, for including our responses to these questions as we say them out loud. Okay. What is program's view of proposed instrumentation purchases? I'll turn this over to Jyoti to start. Hi, thank you, Erin. Yes, uh, so the applicant should detail the equipment needed or to be purchased within their application. Just again, ensuring that you don't exceed the direct cost budget limits. Thank you. Okay. Next question. I've, I've seen this question multiple times. Uh, so perhaps there was some confusion. The RFA indicates four disease study sites. Has this changed to six now? Just trying to assess the sample numbers and what to expect. Uh, Iman, can you answer that question, please? Sure. The, the RFA states that we will fund up to six, thus um, four would be the minimum. I hope that's helpful. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Okay. Next question, uh, this is again for the disease study sites. I presume there's a focus on specific diseases given NCI being one of the partner institutes. Should the study diseases exclusively focus on cancer? Are other disease areas accepted or encouraged? Are there disease areas that would be considered non-responsive? Dr. Martin, I'll kick it back to you for that as well. Of course. 
all diseases uh, would be considered not just cancer. If you're concerned about a particular um, area of study, feel free to reach out to us. Um, but as of now, um, the limit is not to cancer, but we are very happy that we are able to partner with NCI for cancer-focused disease study site. And I think, thank you so much. And uh, in Dr. Morales' FAQ, I think the first response that she had on her PowerPoint provided some additional clarification there as well on the expectations of the disease um, types that we're looking for. Okay, thank you. Next question, would proposals that use metagenomics, metatranscriptomics, and our microbiome sequencing be considered responsive? And I will um, turn this over to Jyoti. Yes, thank you, Erin. Um, so again, uh, just reiterating that we're expecting five ohms to be addressed. Any additional omic data types um, uh, can be proposed as long as it's uh, scientifically justifiable and it meets the data sharing standards. Thank you, Jyoti. Okay, our next question, and this is referring to the systems biology approach. There seems to only be a linear approach from data generation to data analysis. Is there also feedback envisioned in the full scope of a systems biology approach by experimentally validating the computationally driven predictions by analyzing the multi-omics data? I can I can take that, Erin. Um, so so for so we we've envisioned here because part of the goal is the development of methods. Um, we would expect part of the process is to look at validation of these uh, computationally computationally derived methods. So I I would say that there is that expectation that we would be able to do that during the time frame of this program. Thank you, Joanella. Um, Joanella, while you're on camera, I'll, I'll ask you about the next question. <clears throat> and this is specific to the omics production centers, wondering whether, um, well, you, you've addressed the overall budget, I think, multiple times. But the question is about how costs are spread over five years, given most of the omics production is in years two through four. Well, I have addressed the fact that we expect the same budget. Um, and I, I think a lot of, of how the process will be done at the Omics Production Center will be discussed during that first planning year. Um, and so I would say that some of those decisions will, will need to wait until, until that is, is discussed in that year one. But in terms of budgeting, we would expect the same budget to be proposed in all years. Any, any of my colleagues want to expand on that? I think that was clear, but we can add any additional information to the answered question in the chat. Okay. Next question here. Um, are the DSS applications expected to be from a single institution or a group of institutions? Iman? Sure. So the DSS applications can be either from a single institution or collaborative across institutions. Please keep direct cost limitations in mind. Thank you. Thanks, Iman. Okay. The next question is about, uh, again, budgeting for omics production. Oh, and this is dependent on the total N. So again, asking for clarification on the number of DSS sites. So I think we've already heard to um, budget for six DSSs. Uh, Joanella, can you remind folks the, the number of expected participants enrolled at each DSS? Yeah, sure. And, and I, I apologize if there was confusion on the number of DSSs. We are definitely hoping to fund up to six DSSs, and each one should collect or an, 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 uh, plan to uh, pro produce data from all the samples that are submitted by the DSS. And so each DSS should have 
um, 300 participants. We've said 200 with disease and 100 without disease, keeping in mind that there will be collection of biosamples at multiple time points, three time points throughout during the, the time frame of the program. Hopefully that clarifies. Thank you. Okay, we have a question now about um, single cell omics. Um, the allowable budget will not support single cell profiling of all omics modalities. Um, so there's a question of single cell versus bulk omic profiling. Um, Joanella, you did address this in one of your FAQs, but you just mm -hmm. want to restate that. Yeah, so so we the the focus here is on on the five um, molecular data types that we've listed and on the assays that we've we've also listed in the RFA. I mean, we do say that we want some flexibility for the OPCs and the DSSs to be innovative or to suggest other kinds of assays. What we do say is that you must provide justification for why that kind of, of other assay would be scientifically beneficial and also can be accomplished within the budget and the capabilities of, of the OPCs. So I, I would say again, um, some of these decisions on the assays will be finalized during that year one of the of the consortium, uh, but we would be open to suggestions provided, as I said, with the caveats that we need justification. Thank you, Joanella. Uh, I'm going to um, come down just so we have a, a chance to hear from one of our other panelists. Um, Ken, this question is for you. How broad should the environmental exposure data collected um, be within each study? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, so we're interested in a wide variety of different exposures. I would say probably for what NIEHS would um, be most excited about prioritizing, it would probably be an, a DSS application that had multiple traditional environmental exposures with um, social determinants of health. Um, but feel free to reach out, um, you know, to discuss individual uh, applications with me. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. We have another question about, um, let's see. Should OPCs try to anticipate what kinds of samples they will process or what kinds of diseases they might anticipate or use an example? Joanella, can I have you take it? Yeah, a I, I mean, I think it, it, as you might imagine, it's, it's hard for an OPC to predict what kind of applications might come in. But if the goal is to be able to use multiomics to just detect, um, Profiles, associations with profiles and changes over time. Um, I think the OPC should be focused on, on the kinds of assays and the kinds of molecular data that will allow for that. And so I, I'm it, it will be hard for an OPC to try to anticipate that, but it should propose um, the kinds of assays that in general would allow for that kind of activity. And, and that would make sense given the ohms that it has the capability to produce. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a question about, um, we answered the question about environmental exposure data. Um, can there be a strong international component? So I'll have, um, Jyoti, do you wanna answer that question, please? Sure. Um, so uh, again, I'm just referring to the RFA. Um, it is anticipated that additional coordination um, uh, mechanisms may be set up with other US and international groups uh, that may collaborate with the program. Thank you. So I think the primary side has to be uh, uh, domestic, but they can uh, international components can collaborate. That's right. Foreign yeah. foreign components are allowed, but the primary site would be a, a U.S. Correct. institution. Thank you. Okay. Okay. This is sort of a question I think that Joanella began to address. Um, 
and I'll just see if you have any follow-up that you want to add. And this is regarding the dependency between the OPCs and the DSS and the DAC and the DS and the and the OPCs. Um, it is not clear how the DSS proposed a project without. It's not clear how the oh I think this must be OPCs propose a project without knowing about a DSS project. Yeah, and I mean I. I recognize that the way this program works, there's very strong connectivity between all the three components. And that's why we have that year one planning, because that that will be essential to make sure it works. But in terms of the application, I mean, the, the disease study sites understand the disease they're proposing. They understand what makes sense in, uh, to propose for um, omics production and for analysis given the disease that they are studying. And so, so while they don't fully understand the capabilities of the OPCs yet, they can certainly propose um, an approach considering that we're hoping for the five data types that are listed here, and we're hoping to look at associations and, and progression and change over time. For the OPCs, it's also, I understand, not knowing the exact diseases that will come in. But again, the goal here is to propose the kinds of omic data types or omics assays that make sense given the five broad molecular data types that we are after. So that hopefully that provides a little bit more context. But if again, if any of my colleagues want to chime in. Um, feel free to provide further clarification. Thanks. Thanks, Joanella. Okay, we have a question about, for those of us on study sections, is there still continuous submissions? And Dr. Mechanic, can I turn that over to you? Hi, yes. Thanks, Erin. So uh, this is uh, for, for RFA is the continuous submission doesn't apply. It applies in general to R01s, R21s, and R34 applications, our mm -hmm. applications submitted with standard uh, due dates. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm trying to find, look at questions that we haven't addressed yet. There's a question uh, about partnering um, with commercial CROs to provide one of the omics types. Uh, Jyoti, do you want to answer that one? Yes, so uh, applicants may um, partner with a commercial CRO provided that um, they, uh, the budget is within the, the budget limits of uh, the direct costs. Thank you. And I, I'd also add that there, there's no an additional impediments on data sharing with such a partnership. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, how, I think we heard this, but it can't hurt to say it again. How many samples total should OPC's mm -hmm. budget for? Joe and Ella? Yes. So here again, each DSS will have 300 participants and three time points. So that means 900 biosamples per DSS, and we're hoping to fund up to six DSSs. Okay. Will each DSS be able to analyze their own data to meet their own scientific and disease objectives, or is the idea to just generate data that the DAC will analyze? I, I can answer that as okay. well. Um, Yes, no. So the goal is for each DSS to engage in data analysis. So so this is not, you know, the the... The idea is not for the DAC to do all the analysis. They will facilitate collaborative analysis, but each DSS will be engaged in the analysis of their own data. Okay, and here's a follow-up question. Are there plans for pooled analysis at the coordination center? Um, what if the six centers funded focus on dis different diseases? Yeah, and that, that again is part of that year one planning in terms of collaborative analysis. It, it, it obviously, um, it, it won't, it's not pooled at the coordination center. Let me just clarify it, it. All the components will work together with the coordination center facilitating and taking the lead. 
But the idea is that they will all work together in that Anvil workspace that I hopefully was able to describe. But um, but yes, I mean, the, the, the diseases will, will probably be different, but there is a hope that there can be some collaborative efforts and hopefully push forward uh, the, the, the hope that we have of producing methods as part of this program. Thank you. All right, we've got a, a number of great questions coming in here. Okay, there's um, a question on, but well, we, we've discussed this already, how critical is the environmental exposure component? Um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Kim and Joannelle if you wanted to add anything um, in addition to what's already been said. Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly for what NIHS is going to support, um, we would need to have a strong environmental component. And, um, you know, I believe NCI is, you know, um, encouraging that also, but um, obviously NHGRI uh, do, does not need that environmental component. So we're not necessarily anticipating that all of the DSS centers will, will have that. Jonella or Mon, anything to add to that? I, no, I think Kim, unless Iman wants to add, I think Kim covered it pretty well. Okay. No, nothing to add. Great. We had a couple of questions that I'll group together regarding the OPCs. Can they, um, similar to the DSS as the questions, can they come in um, as an application of multiple institutions? There was at least two questions about that. Uh, Jyoti? Uh, yes, yes, they can come in uh, with multiple inst uh, institutions, um, again, within the the, um, the budget uh, limits that we have. Okay, wonderful. Yes. Okay, there's a question. Um, will there only be one site for cancer? Is it preferred it focuses on one or multiple cancers? Leah, may I turn this one over to you? Sure. Um, I'm not sure I totally, I guess, is it asking, I'm not totally sure I understand the question. I think it's asking whether or not there will be overlap in the in the cancer types per disease study site. Um, would you have two disease study sites with the same cancer? And um, Oh, or is it, no, it's asking the opposite. Is it, it's asking whether or not uh, a DC study site can look at multiple cancers. I think, you know, you know, this gets back to as, as long as you're, you know, you're making the good scientific argument for the multiple cancers um, or the single cancer. I mean, I think our vision was probably more along the lines of single cancers, but multiple cancers could be possible. And um, as long as you're within the budget for the disease study site. So, um, and I don't know, Melissa, if you have anything to add, you can feel free to put that. Yeah, I guess, you know, power calculation, if you are studying more than one cancer and we are looking only at 200 cases here, um, you know, adding more cancer type might get challenging, but if you can make an argument that's feasible, you know, we are open to different scientific questions. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, here's a question about um, the disease study sites, FOA. I just lost it here. Okay, can the university lead be in the U.S., but the population under study be based abroad? Uh, Dr. Martin? This indeed might uh, require extra steps. So if you have a particular proposal in mind, uh, you may want to reach out to the team, um, but uh, it is per the RFA, that is not impossible. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. There's, um, we've answered questions about multiple institutions. Will each DSS need to conduct multi-omics data analysis? Joanella, you answered this, but you just want to restate yeah, that. Yeah, I did. I did answer. I did say that, yes, the expectation is that the disease study sites will be engaged in data analysis processes. Okay. And, and you did um, cover this, but 
at least I think you did in your presentation. So there's a question about, um, could you confirm that a DSS doesn't include the cost of sequencing or other omics costs in the budget for the disease study site FOA-008? No, so the, the data production is an activity of the OPCs. So we expect the budget for that to be in the OPCs. So the RFA-009. Okay. Um, there is a question on, um, is there a preference for diseases based on prevalence, i.e. more common diseases versus rare diseases? Joanella, then I'm on. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just start by saying we we haven't we haven't outlined preference of disease. I mean, we again we're focused on conditions where a multiomics approach would be would be advantageous. And so clearly the applicant needs to come in with strong justification describing how how the approaches could be used for their disease, but we haven't really you know, provided a, a, a list of priority diseases. And the prevalence of the disease um, is not um, a limitation necessarily, um, although the statistical uh, acumen to answer the question from a multi-omic perspective must stay at the forefront according to the RFA. So ensuring the proper empiric grounding for the disease chosen as well as the proper um, statistical rationale um, within the limitations of the budget, as well as the sample numbers provided in the RFA. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There's a question about, um, it appears that the DAC will be required to develop six different electronic data capture systems for each of the different disease types at a DSS. Is that correct? Joanella, can you try to kick us off on that one? Yeah, so we'll be required to six different electronic data capture systems for each of the DAC of the six. I mean, so the DAC is responsible to liaising with the ANVIL ecosystem to set up the workspaces. So um, each, each site and center will have its own workspace, but there will also be shared workspaces where all the components of the consortium, consortium can come in and contribute. So I'm not sure if that's what you meant by electronic data capture systems, but the data that will be produced and released as part of the consortium at the end or towards the end will come out of one of the shared workspaces and that will be the DAC's responsibility. And I would I would add, I suppose, that it, it would be, as you said, that the DAC will work with each of the DSSs. I think there'll have to be an overarching data model um, for the program as a whole. And the DACs, as you said, will work with the DSSs to ensure they can receive the data in an appropriate format. Okay, wonderful. Um, uh, there is a question about clarifying the budget for the data analysis and coordination center. So it it's, I think first, can you confirm the direct cost limit um, for year one and the out years? Um, I know you you already provided this, Joan Ella, but it'd be helpful to just state that again um, because there was some some confusion about the language um, where sure. it says NHGRI intends to commit up to 1.45 and then NIEHS and NCI are contributing an additional amount. Right. And so the amount of the overall, so when you combine all the different contributions from the different ICs, the direct costs for each DSS is 500,000. The direct cost for the OPC provided that it's one OPC producing all the data types, it's 2.7 million. And for the DAC, it's 950,000, the direct costs for the DAC. Okay, thank you. I see there's a question um, about the Anvil. And um, Joanella, I'll read it and ask you to respond. And uh, Dr. 
Ken Wiley, who oversees uh, the Anvil, um, just stepped into my office. So if we need any clarification, he can provide any follow-up. Um, for the DAC and sharing of summary level data within a portal, is this expected to be something integrated with it, within Anvil or an independent tool? So that that is actually a decision that will be done, um, probably will be discussed during the year one, but it can be done independently of the Anvil. Um, it's not necessarily tied to the Anvil. Okay, thank you. Okay, here's a question. It was mentioned that approximately 300 individuals will be needed and that tumor and normal adjacent tissue would be potentially a priority for NCI. But the number of samples need to be adjusted for this, i.e. 150 individuals. Um, can I turn this over to Leah? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. So um, I, I guess just to clarify too, the way the RFA is written, it's 200 cases and 100 um, controls uh, just for the sample numbers. Um, I think the I think the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, we, we, we wouldn't necessarily need to do all the omics assays on all the, uh, on, on all the tumor samples. Um, you may select some, some of the different assays. And I think to think about the, um, the planning within the first year of the consortium and, and, how, and, and how we're going to select the omics measures by the OPC. Thank you, Leah. Okay, um, will DSS sites be required to collect biofluids for other DSS targets, i.e. blood and tissue, even if they are not part of the initial DSS proposal? So that's sort of getting at the flexibility of a DSS to be able to align with other um, DSS awards. Joanella, I'll let you go ahead first if you'd like. And then I, I'm, I'm struggling keeping up with the Q and A because it's moving so fast. So I didn't, I didn't, I, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't capture that. That's so if you have an answer, the, that would be great. Great. the The question was whether or not uh, bio samples outside, like fluids, for example, blood or urine, in addition to tissue, um, would it be required? of a DSS in addition uh, to the proposed 300. So would that be an additional requirement on top of? And we've had other questions in the chat as well about whether or not it can be proposed. Those That was the question. I think it can, it can be proposed, but it's not a requirement. Exactly. And hopefully, um, again, keeping the costs in mind and the scientific question in mind with regards to the OMS specified. So uh, for the OMS uh, proposed, keeping in mind what uh, source would be ideal um, to see that OM with regards to the disease proposed. I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Iman. Leah, this is a follow-up question um, about cancer studies, and um, forgive me if you already covered this. Will normal tissue coming from the cancer patient be considered healthy case so we can reduce the number of healthy participants? Uh, so um, I think, you know, the way that FO, the RFA is set up, we want uh, people with disease and people without disease. So the normal tissue from uh, a cancer patient wouldn't count the individual uh, as, a, as a healthy control. So I think, uh, but you know, feel free to uh, follow up with uh, Melissa and I on the specific question uh, if we haven't quite addressed it. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, here's a question for Jyoti. Uh, this is referring to a question about <clears throat> the budget. So we have the, the cost of the OPCs averaged out from years one through five. Um, and the question was, oh, I just lost it here. The question was, um, 
can the money be carried forward from year one to support omic analysis when the samples become available? Year one is a planning period. When the samples become available. Yeah, so um, yes, year one is a planning period. And as far as money being carried over, um, that is something that program would work with the grantee um, on that, on the, you know, the specifics of the grant. Okay. Um, another question for NCI. Is NCI interested in cancer precursors? H example, HPV or cervical cancer? Yes, I think uh, cancer precursors fit within our interest and scope. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, some of these I think we've answered. So I'm just going to click, for example, can the OPCs be comprised of multiple institutions? I'll just click that we've answered that um, because that, that has been addressed. Um, okay. Would omics data from disease-associated microbiomes um, be responsive to this FOA? Joanella? I mean, I think that th this we tried to address already that additional omics data types beyond the five molecular omics data types can be proposed and can be justified. So the applicant would need to justify how they would be beneficial for the for the study they're proposing. Thank you. OK. For the DSS, can two sites proposing the same diseases with differences in diversity or aims be funded? Joanella, do you want to describe, or Iman, the program expectations here? Joanella, please go ahead first. Oh, I, I was, I was going to say, I, I think we're, we're aiming for pro programmatic diversity here so we probably wouldn't fund more than one dss with the same disease i mean that would be that would be my 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 guess like <laughs> but i so I, i'm not sure maybe i misunderstood the question but that that is what i was on what i understood was being was being said multiple dsss on the same disease I think additional, the question is also asking whether or not if it was the same disease, but a different constellation of populations represented, um, would that suffice to allow for uh, the funding of two? I think that would be hard to discern a priority. Yeah. I think we'd actually have to see it. That's right. And just reiterating programmatic balance to achieve the overall goals of, goals of the program, we are looking for the methods <clears throat> and the protocols that come out of this program to be generalizable. So if there's an opportunity to deploy those across a number of diseases, I think that would be preferred. Beneficial. Right. Okay. Um, there was a question about the NCI CPTAC program, um, which is ongoing. Um, and there was a question about connecting with them for advice um, on some of the, the challenges that they've already identified. Leah? Is yeah, I think, I, think that? That, I think that's a great point. And we'll be sure to talk to our CPTAC colleagues about um, uh, their lessons learned and, and challenges. Thank you. I'm seeing we have about 15 minutes left. I'm just looking through the queue to see what questions haven't been answered yet. Um, Aaron, there are a lot of questions on the number of samples and biosamples. So mm -hmm. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna explain that again. Okay. That that we we expect to fund six disease sites, and each disease site should recruit or enroll 300 participants. But each participant will have three biosamples because they will be collected at three different time points. So that means that that each DSS would have 300 times three. And so the OPCs would have to produce data from all the biosamples that would be submitted from all six DSSs. Hopefully that, that helps. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and sorry, I see that there's a question about three whole genomes per participant. Uh, no, so you wouldn't have to do whole genome sequencing 
at three different time points. Thank you. Okay. With the disease focus, our approaches to integrate diseases encouraged. Example, looking at um, comorbidities between behavioral and chronic medical diseases, chronic medical diseases in integration with social determinants of health. So I think, you know, are, are we looking within the goals of the consortium to be able to integrate um, methods and, and data across different conditions, integrating social determinants of health um, as well? Joan, Ellen, you want to try to take that? Um, again, I... I... Okay, I'm troubled I know tracking the Q and A because it just moves. There are so many coming in. I I'm not tracking with the question. I apologize, Erin. That's okay. I think I can answer the question that that yes, you know, again, ultimately thinking about the overarching goals of this program, we are looking for the outcome to be generalizable methods that aren't disease specific. So of course, part of the proposal would be being able to to integrate and analyze the data relevant for your proposed disease, but at the same time, it's advantageous to propose and think about methods to be able to, um, to integrate um, and leverage the data from other programs as relevant, other disease areas as relevant. Okay. There's a few questions again about, I think, the international versus domestic component. So um, can clinical sites be based out of the US? Um, Dr. Martin, you answered that, but why don't you just answer it again since there's a few questions still coming up about that. I think if you have a very specific um, kind of programmatic structural idea, definitely reach out to us. There may be additional steps required if the constellation of the partners is international. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Okay, there's a question um, about sample size here, um, referring to the sample size of, of 300, um, is, that, is that sufficiently powered for multi-omics analysis? Jonelle, do you wanna add anything there? I think you did cover some of the rationale for that in your presentation. Yeah. Um... So I th I think that you you the applicant would have to include um, power analyses to demonstrate that it can that the study it's it's proposing is um, is suitable for a multiomic approach. Thank I don't you. know if that that helps. And leveraging the 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 pool uh, comparator group as well. Okay. Um, there are other questions here about um, do you expect sample collection materials to be included in the DSS budget or will the OPC purchase in bulk and provide to the DSS? Um, will the DSS or OPC incorporate the shipping costs? So that's sort of a detailed question, but I think it's Good to reiterate again the expectations of the D DSS versus the OPC. Yeah, the, the the DSS should budget for the sample collection, not the OPCs. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, here is a question about um, computing costs. Will strides cover the cloud compute and storage cost overruns? It seems near, it seems challenging to budget for data storage and compute with so many unknown variables. And I see my um, colleague Ken Wiley is here and he might be able to add to that. Hello, can you hear? Hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, yes, yeah, so strides can help provide some support for its compute storage and egress cloud just using Anvil. Um, if there, there's also a page that um, we will provide that um, if you go to the anvilportal.org um, site, there's a page where it gives you a list of information about uh, the budget, how to budget for using Anvil. Um, and so we can put that also in the 
chat that they can hear. So we'll I'll, we'll put that in there for people to use. Um, but you should be able to. Um, but I want to make it very clear that Strides will require your university to have a existing uh, contract with a third party group, and that could take some time to set up. And so you should make sure that you've uh, allowed the appropriate time to allow your institute to form those agreements that need to be in place with this third party group in order to be able to set up Strides accounts and receive cloud credits. Uh, Janella, um, rest of the team, is something else you want to add? No, I thank you, Ken, for clarifying that. No thank you. And uh, our team, Joanella O'Reilly, will put that link that you referred to, Ken, in the chat. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Can we can uh, we clarify um, the whether or not it's one bio sample per visit? Yeah. So the the goal is to yes. The answer the answer is yes because we budgeted for. Um, 300 participants at three time at points. three time points. Okay, here's a question about can different omics be proposed to be conducted by different tissue types for the same participant? Yeah. Joanelle, did you catch that yeah. question? Yeah, so this was about um, I think I saw the question. <laughs> Uh, more than one type of sample per so different it, tissue for the yeah, same participant. Right. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, the again, I think this is something that that can be proposed by by the DSS. But the idea was that it would be three bio samples at so three hundred participants, three different time points. Um, not necessarily expecting the collection of more than one tissue per 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 visit, for example. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question for our colleagues from NCI for the cancer disease study site. Can we propose just plasma collection and no tissue? Um, well, that's definitely a possibility. We do encourage uh, strongly the collection of both tumor uh, uh, and, and, and normal. So uh, in, in that case, and so I encourage you to reach out to us specifically about what you're proposing and, and we'll follow up with you. Thank you. There's a question about time scale for relapsing disease states. Mm -hmm. Should they occur within five years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm touch on this, John Ella, do you want to add? Yeah, the, the expectation is that that we would collect um, within the time frame of the program. So hopefully the proposed study, you would be able to, to see that kind of disease progression during, during that time frame. Okay. Okay, there's a number of questions about budget. Um, I'm gonna let my team digest some of those questions and see if you wanna come back with any specific overarching response to some of those specific budget questions. And then in the meantime, I'll see if the other questions um, can be addressed. Okay, here's a question again, uh, Leah, will the OPC be able to adapt sequencing assays for cancel sam samples, for example, much deeper Whole genome sequencing is required for tumor tissue. Should this be included in the DSS plan? So the um, the DSS should propose um, what omics characterizations makes the most sense um, for uh, for their disease study site, and then. Um, with, it, with an assumption that that first year of planning will have some uh, discussions with the, uh, the consortia and the OPC about um, what uh, omics that they will ultimately be pursuing. So I think um, uh, it's really thinking about what really makes the most sense. Um, and with that, I might ask Melissa if she has anything to add to that question response. Mm, yeah, I, I don't have much to add. I would uh, say yes, be in touch with us. And, um, you know, it can be also a combination of not having the same assay done on all the samples at, you know, at each time point. But, um, yeah, we, 
we definitely uh, are encouraging having also the tumor sample. And of course, you know, it's also a resource if you collect it and, and we don't have the uh, means to uh, sequence everything through this specific uh, program is always something that can be added uh, later on to the bulk of knowledge. And again, during that first year would be planned what makes more sense to do through this program, but the resource might still be uh, valuable. So I would encourage to propose what you can do within the strongest scientific question you can propose. Thank you. Um, there was a question about past performance um, as far as what are we looking for um, I guess for expertise for the data analysis and coordination center. Yeah, I can try to answer that. I mean, we did include some information on the required expertise in throughout the RFA, having a strong record of coordination and um, and experience with Anvil would be definitely recommended given how a lot of the work will be in the Anvil ecosystem. Thank you. And then again, as you would in any application, just describe, describing your overall um, experience and expertise relevant to the particular FOA that you're applying to. Okay. Yeah, and we've got five minutes left. So I'm just trying to get through here to see um, if there's any questions from outside of the categories that we already addressed. Um, there's a question about sort of the overall, I think, um, internal organizational structure for each of the centers. So there's a question about, is there a particular internal structure required? Uh, for example, a number uh, of components with research focus as well as core activities. I, I don't I don't think we've specified in the RFA any particular structure. I think we would expect to, for the applicant to propose that, but I think there is flexibility on that. Right, and there's there's um, expectations in the FOAs about sort of your, your role as the individual research team and then your role um, in coordinating and collaborating with the other disease study sites, OPCs and DAC. So, you know, that's, that's the area where we'll be looking for some structure within our you know, the three components of our program, but nothing specific um, is expected within each of your internal applications. Okay. Okay. There is a question, a number of questions um, where the, the gist is that there are investigators that are interested in responding to this program, but don't necessarily have a full um, comprehensive team at their institution. And um, I think the question was whether or not we can facilitate any of that. And I think our um, one recommendation that we have would be looking um, at the NIH reporter, which is a public resource. So you can um, do a search on a particular disease or you know an advanced search with disease and omic analysis and see um, the, the response as far as which investigators may be working in a disease area with a, a genomics or omics uh, area of expertise on top of that. That might be a good place to start. Do any of my colleagues want to add anything to that? Okay. Okay, there's a question about um, whether or not these funding opportunities are recommended for established PIs only, or can junior early career PIs also apply? It's it's not specific to established PIs. Junior early career PIs can apply. Wonderful, thank you. Okay. Okay, so with two minutes left, I'm going to turn to my colleagues and ask, I've been trying to go through the queue. There are some questions listed as open. I know we did address them. Are there any outstanding questions that you want to address now live? Otherwise, we will make sure to include written answers for all of these questions in the FAQ that goes to our website. 
Thanks, Aaron, for moderating that session. There were a lot. Of, we thank you for your participation. There were a lot of questions, really good questions. And as Aaron said, we'll make a point to draft answers, compile them, and post them on our website. And and I didn't see any any particular question that we should jump to answer right now. Um, we covered a lot of ground, I think. Okay. And again, we will be sure to answer all of these questions and add them to the FAQ. If you have follow-up questions, um, please send us an email. We can put the email in the chat um, if we haven't done that already. Riley, do you have the email address that you can pop in the chat, please? Riley has done so. I see okay. here that she's yes, posted. Been put in few yeah, times. she posted the website as well as the email multiomicsprogram at mail.nih.gov. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. Take care. Again, we appreciate your participation from the audience, our panelists, of uh, program directors, and um, our communications team. Thanks again. Thank you.